Post-war Lionel, intermodal railroading, and the story of this often overlooked accessory on this episode of Toy Train Tips and Tricks. Hello again, this is Mike with Toy Train Tips and Tricks, and today we're taking a look at what I believe is uh, one of the unsung accessories of the post-war era, the Lionel number 460 piggyback transportation set. Now, for an accessory that was cataloged for three years, in this case from 1955 to 57, uh, there's not a lot of literature about this accessory, and uh, it seems to have been uh, forgotten by many collectors and operators. But as you see, it is a rather neat accessory operation. It, it couldn't be simpler. And, uh, and there's a lot of potential here. And this is an accessory that uh, was really forward-looking. It was state-of-the-art as far as railroad operations at the time that the accessory was cataloged. The accessory was available two ways. There was the number 460P uh, that contained just the platform and the forklift. And there was the regular 460 set, which included, of course, the platform, the forklift, two of these original green trailers and your number 460 piggyback flat car. Operation is very simple. It's manually controlled with a lever and a wheel. You would rotate the wheel to get the forklift in your particular position. And Lionel helped you out here. On the trailer casting are two little tabs, which on the original sh should be painted red. And that shows you where to line up your fork. And so we're lined up. I'm going to lift my lever, take the trailer off of the flat car. And if you can see here, there are two metal tabs that uh, the track goes into to make sure you're the proper distance away from the platform. Geometry is very important in the operation of this accessory. So I've lifted my trailer up and I'm going to rotate it around and drop it in its spot on the landing pad here where the molded dimples go and rotate it around and I can do the same thing with the other car. I'm not going to on this car because actually I need to make a, a little repair to, uh, to this car, uh, this trailer. So this set is not in perfect condition. I have a few minor repairs, replacements, but the operation is great. So things that are missing, uh, there's a screw that's supposed to go here that holds the forklift onto our mechanism. Um, there is a little blue man who goes here on the forklift, and he is, uh, there are reproductions available for under $5. They're all over, um, but uh, he's really undersized. He's practically just slightly over HO scale. As you see, this is undersized, and I'm missing one wheel, which again, reproductions are available. Um, probably just going to take this wheel and use it as a pattern and 3D print a match to the other side. The wheels don't actually need to rotate. As a matter of fact, they do not touch the platform. Um, they are raised up and out of the way. They're just for decoration. The flat car is intact, the 3460 flat car with the metal racking that holds the piggybacks in place and the piggyback trailers themselves. These are the originals. The original green come with the 460 set, should have the Lionel trains placards on either side, as well as Freuhoff, I think is pronounced, Duravan, an actual product. And uh, Originals will also have a sticker right down here. This one has fallen off. You can see part of the original sticker on this one, where it also said Freuhoff. Uh, now this one, there's a metal clip here that is missing, and so this comes off. That's why I'm not going to uh, show the operation of this trailer until I make this little minor repair. So because this one was not in perfect box condition, uh, I got it for a surprisingly low price. Matter of fact, I paid more for shipping than I paid for the actual product. My 14-year-old uh, spent hours playing with this when it came, <laughs> even before I got it even close to putting it on the layout, just putting the trailer on, putting the trailer off. Um, you know, so in the age of video games, this simple mechanism works. Now, as I mentioned, there's not a lot of documentation on these. As a matter of fact, uh, for the mechanism itself, I've never seen an exploded diagram, just an instruction sheet. And uh, so I've only seen one of these taken apart. 
And even that was not in person, it's in a video. So I'm going to take this apart so we can see what's going on inside. And I think what we're going to find is that this one has been modified somewhat from the original factory version. So to take it apart, I've removed the trailers, I've removed the track. Uh, normally we would have to unscrew the screw that's here, but in this case, we're just gonna pick it up, move it away. And then we have two screws right here. And you see this one, again, it's not in perfect condition. There's a crack there, but that doesn't affect my operation any at all. I'm gonna remove these two screws and that's going to give us access to the inside. Turn it over. And with this side loose now, there are two tabs over here and we can just reach in and pull this bottom plate off. And now we have access. So on this side, uh, this is basically our lever that controls the height of the fork. So on this, yes, yeah, there's some gunk there that needs to be cleaned off. It's making that sticky. So you want to make sure that that's clean. You might put a little bit of oil right here on this pivot point. Um, but other than that, that's all that goes with this part. So here you see we have our wheel and a, a long rod that goes to this metal stopper here and to this metal plate. Now, the only other version of this I've ever seen, this metal plate was smooth. And let's try to zoom in here. If you look here, these striations, uh, also the other version I've seen did not have these two washers, which help keep the rod in the proper position. Hello, this is Mike of the future butting in. Since shooting this part of the video, I've continued to be curious about the mechanism used in my number 460. I still have been unable to locate either an exploded diagram or another example of a number 460 mechanism to examine to compare with mine. But I did find the exploded parts diagram for the number 462 Derrick platform that shares many of the same parts with the number 460. And what I have found is that clearly my mechanism has been modified. First of all, the rubber tip at the end of the drive shaft should be a number 460-25 uh, rubber sleeve. That was the same part that was used in the number 462, and it is clearly not the part that is in mine. My rubber piece is some unidentified, almost tire looking piece, and that is the reason for the two washers as spacers, because my rubber piece is smaller, is not as wide as the regular part, the number 460-25. Secondly, as we look at the number 462 and we zoom in, we look at the metal platter and clearly in this version, we can see the striations on the 462 that are present on my number 460. That leads me to believe that either the part was modified somewhere in production as an improvement of the mechanism from the completely smooth version to the striated version, or Someone, when they modified the other rubber piece, also modified this by taking the platter off of a number 462 Derrick platform and putting it on my number 460. So if anyone has any additional information about this particular part and the striations on the metal platter, please leave a comment and uh, enlighten us on uh, this detail so that we can all learn together. And now back to your regular video. There is clearly too much grease here, so I'm going to clean some of this off. Just slide that, and let's get rid of some of this excess. The whole thing comes off. That's okay. Yeah, that looks a whole lot better. Actually, we'll put our washers back on here. Our two washers for spacers, our little rubber. This looks like a wheel. And we're just going to pop that on there. It doesn't have, it's not on there tight, uh, just enough to make some contact. We'll flip this spring back up, slide that under, and boom. You might find for your particular application that you might need to bend the angle of this slightly, depending on, uh, you know, if the fork is too high at rest, it's not going to fit underneath the trailers. If it's too low, it won't fit over onto the flat car. So you need to get it in that proper range. And your track height is 
probably going to make some difference with that. So you might make some adjustments to that angle depending on your particular setup. But this, you know, just being, you know, a little sheet metal here that's pretty easy to bend into whatever configuration you need. All right, I'm going to put it back together. Okay, we're reassembled. And just to show you operation here without anything in the way, with the wheel that turns our little plate under here. So this makes a complete 360 degree circle. So again, geometry is very important for the operation of the accessory in that in order to pick up the trailers, you have to get it aligned just right so that our two tabs here line up diagonally with the four holes, either on this side or this side, depending on which side you have put the trailer on. This accessory will work with trailers other than the original green ones, but of uh, all of the different designs, it has to have all four holes. This is a later trailer with only two holes in the mold. You can see where the other two holes used to be. This one really won't work. Uh, this will fall off as you try to move the trailer around. So again, when you put the trailer in the divots right here on the platform, as you go around, you see I might be a little bit too high here. I might have to adjust that. But when my fork is right here between the two red marks on the trailer, it's lined up. We're pretty close there, nailed it that time. So we can rotate this around a full 360 degree circle and drop it on the trailer, which would be back here. So as I said, as this was made in 1955 through 57, this was pretty much state of the art railroad technology. Now the idea of carrying trailers on flat cars really goes back to the end of the 19th century, but it was of limited use. Things like circus trailers, uh, sometimes horse-drawn carts, but as a regular service, putting trailers on flat cars really didn't begin until about 1936. The Chicago Great Western Railroad started using some service to some of the smaller towns along its route. This practice was deemed successful, and it was picked up by several other railroads, including the New Haven, which by the outbreak of World War II, the New Haven had the largest piggyback fleet of any North American railroad. Still at this time, most of our piggyback service was just an individual trailer or two mixed in with a regular freight. There was not dedicated trailer trains to this point, not until 1953, when Southern Pacific began service of dedicated trains of nothing but piggyback service for less than carload service. So by 1955, when this accessory was made, not only Southern Pacific, but Pennsylvania, Norfolk, and Western, other railroads were catching on to the efficiencies of using this piggyback trailer service for less than carload service. Uh, and it was taking off uh, by leaps and bounds. Also, most piggyback service at this time did use shorter trailers such as this. Uh, this one measures out to just under 20 feet. 20 foot to about 28 foot trailers were typical uh, in piggyback service up until the late 1950s. And even after, uh, you often found the shorter trailers in piggyback service. As a matter of fact, even today, uh, 28 foot trailers are the preferred method for parcel services like FedEx, UPS, etc. Keeping in mind that, first of all, piggyback service itself was brand new to the scene, but also that the interstate highway system was yet to be constructed. Um, most trailers were built pretty light duty for just around town service. We didn't have the long haul roadworthy trailers that we have today uh, in 1955. Most trailers were loaded not using forklifts, but using ramps uh, where a truck would pick up the trailer and back it onto a long string of trailers um, one at a time. Then these uh, lightweight trailers had to have jack stands applied and had to be strapped down to the flat car in order to, to make it because the suspensions were not sufficient to hold the trailers on the flat cars themselves without damaging the trailers. It wasn't until later in the 1950s and then the 1960s when 
dedicated trailer on flat car or Toffsy equipment was being made with built in fifth wheels. And by then the trailers were getting longer, 35, 40, 45, 48, up to today's 53 foot. And they were made for more long haul, heavy duty service with stiffer underframes. And so it was just a matter of getting the trailer onto the flat car. So while the idea of putting trailers on and off of flat cars using a forklift, uh, it probably existed. Matter of fact, it most certainly existed in some form. Ramp service in the 1950s was by far the most common. Now today, special forklifts, either from side loaders, straddle loaders, or overhead cranes, are the most common way to load and unload trailers and containers onto flat cars. But as we look at the markings here on the forklift, the Ross trail loader, by the way, uh, early versions had the sticker like this, later versions were heat stamped. This Ross trail loader, why is there a sticker here? Lionel would be very unlikely to go to the added cost of marking these with an actual brand name, Ross. Ross was a Michigan firm that built forklifts tractors and such. Uh, apparently many of their products went to England during World War II for the war effort. Ross was bought by Clark Equipment in 1953, but the Ross name survived for a while. Obviously trail loader for trailer loader would be a model name for a particular type of forklift for loading piggyback equipment. I was unable to find really any specific information about a Ross trail loader, save for one short little comment made on a message board for those who collect tractors. Someone mentioned that they had once owned a Ross trail loader, but I could find no other information, no photos or anything about it. However, other photos that I found of Ross products show many forklifts in this same general shape with the tricycle gear. So this was most likely an actual product. Otherwise, Lionel, again, would not have gone to the expense of adding this. As a matter of fact, Ross probably paid Lionel a fee to have this put on their product. The Ross trail loader most certainly existed. Uh, how successful it was in the 1950s, it's hard to say. Since even as trailers became longer and longer for piggyback service and highway service through the 60s, 70s, 80s, and up to today, it's still not unreasonable to use these shorter trailers on your layout because many of these short trailers are still popular with parcel services like UPS, FedEx, even the U.S. Mail. So even having these short trailers mixed in with the longer 40, 45, and 48 feet is not out of the question today. One problem with the Lionel version of piggyback service, though, is having the trailers back to back as such. Although I have seen a photo showing that this did sometimes happen when trailers were loaded from the side onto flat cars. Since most loading was done by ramps and then by the late 1950s, early 1960s, dedicated flat cars with built-in fifth wheels uh, were common and those were always set the same direction. This is the actual configuration that your trailer should be in. However, not only with the loader, but with the mechanism that holds the trailers onto the flat car, <laughs> this won't work very well. So if you can ignore that one little problem with their operation, otherwise Lionel's piggyback operations are pretty close to prototype. So here again, we have the Lionel number 460 piggyback platform, a neat little accessory that uh, has been largely ignored over the past several decades. Uh, it's an inexpensive accessory as long as you're not getting the complete boxed version with all inserts. When you get a version that needs a little bit of work like this one, you can get it for quite a, a discount. But it is still fun and it still reflects regular, realistic railroad operations. So I hope you've enjoyed this video as much as I've enjoyed making it. And again, if so, please like it, share it, subscribe, and tell your friends, tell your neighbors. Meanwhile, keep those trains and trailers running. And we'll catch you next time on Toy Train Tips and Tricks.